Hi, everyone. My name is Father Alex Gusetis. I serve as the director of the Center for Family Care, and our department periodically produces webinars that help to address the needs and concerns of the faithful. And we're thrilled this evening to welcome Dr. Vadaskevi Tibbs. And our topic tonight is how do we understand Orthodox marriage today? A few bullet points to talk about first before I introduce our speaker and offer her background. First is we want to express gratitude to Leadership 100 for underwriting this aspect of our ministry and the production of webinars and really their ongoing support in all that we do. Second, we want this to be an interactive webinar, so your insights and your questions are welcomed. There is a chat box that you'll see on your screen. Throughout tonight's program, feel free to offer any insight and questions. We hope to get to some of them, and we'll see as time uh, elapses. One little note different from our prior webinars is that with this particular software, your name will appear with whatever insight or question you pose. In the past, it was always anonymously. So just full disclosure so that you're aware that uh, your name will appear in the chat as well. And then finally, if you have family and friends that weren't able to be with us tonight live, please know that this webinar will be recorded, it will be archived, and it will be made available on our website, family.goarch.org and on our Facebook page as well. So let me introduce our guest. Dr. Eve Baraskevi Tibbs holds a PhD in systematic theology with a minor in church history from Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California, where she has also served on the faculty since 2005. Her recent book, A Basic Guide to Eastern Orthodox Theology, Introducing Beliefs and Practices, with the foreword by His All Holiness Patriarch Bartholomew, was released last year. Dr. Tibbs served six years as chair of the Eastern Orthodox Studies Group of the American Academy of Religion and currently serves as the ministry lead for Christian education and on the Metropolis Council of the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of San Francisco. Dr. Tibbs attends St. Paul's Greek Orthodox Church in Irvine, where she serves as the choir director, as a chanter, Bible study leader, and executive chair of the church school board. She and her husband, Stephen, have been blessed with three amazing daughters, their equally wonderful husbands, and eight adorable grandchildren. Thank you for speaking with us tonight, Dr. Eve. It's my, it's my great honor to be here, Father. Thank you. So, it's a heavy topic. There's so much to discuss, but we have to start from the beginning. And what would be a simple working definition of orthodox marriage? Simple, you say. Well, a description anyway. The orthodox uh, church views Christian marriage as many things, as a school, as a journey, as a little kingdom, as a path to salvation. But simply stated, marriage is the day-to-day -day living out of the sacramental joining of a Christian man and a Christian woman together to Jesus Christ. And, and I'm being really careful about the language here because Christian marriage is not just about the two persons, at least in the Orthodox view, but three, we might say. So the two, the husband and wife, become one unit in a way. And that unit is joined together to Christ. So the head of the household in Christian marriage is really Jesus Christ because um, as I mentioned, one of the family's purposes is to together as a path to salvation. I know, not simple, but definition in any event. But already a really important point that this is not just an event that is between the, the husband and the wife. This is encompasses welcoming the presence of the God, the presence of God in the unity and in the in the relationship. So that already is something very significant that it's not just about the bride and groom. But this really entails the presence of God uh, in their in their life and in their marriage. So in one of your writings, you state the following, and I just want to read this aloud. In marriage, it is not only the sacramental prayers that are held in high regard, but the entire marriage that is considered to be sacramental. What, what do you mean by this quote? Thank, thank you. Great question. So I guess um, we call our 
uh, the service of, of the wedding service, holy matrimony, and it's one of the sacraments of the Orthodox Church. And the reason I was stumbling is because we use that term sacrament because everybody knows what it means. But we Orthodox actually call our sacraments holy mysteries. Um, nevertheless, the I mentioned that um, one of the purposes of marriage is the path to salvation together. So if we think of Christian marriage in a variety of those ways that I mentioned, school, journey, kingdom, it shares the same aim as the church, which leads its members to salvation. So we, the wedding service is important, but then again, um, the living out day to day of the sacramental joining of husband and wife together, whatever makes them a family unit, means that God will continue to offer his grace in and through their married life as, as they continue to follow Christ as the head of their family. So this is how the entire marriage, not just the moment at, by which at, at the time that they're joined, the entire marriage as an ideal is sacramental. Even if we fail to live up to that ideal, um, it's the journey or the school of marriage that continues to be um, full of grace as it follow, as as the couple follows Christ. So I think you may have uh, responded to my next question because I really like the term path to salvation. Really, that's a that's that's really jumped out at me when you said that. But I'll pose the question anyway and allow you to kind of follow up. Theologically speaking, does Orthodox view marriage as a contract, a covenant, or a mystery? Because that's it, people understand it differently, whether in secular circles or even within the church. What what is this that we're doing? Is this something that's just a legal contract? Is it a, a covenant, an agreement, or you even used the word mystery a moment ago as well? Absolutely. As actually, I borrowed that from Saint Paul um, in his letter to the church at Ephesus. He calls marriage a great mystery. Um, but our Western culture does have different ideas, as you mentioned, Father. You mentioned a contract. That's an agreement between two entities that has a legal ramification if it's broken. Um, and we tend to think of a covenant in terms of a promise or a pledge. And that, that tends to be what the Western world, uh, secular culture, as well as Christian culture, tends to think of as marriage. The two ideas are pretty similar, but in both cases, two people or two entities are agreeing or promising to do something. Those of us who've attended a non-Orthodox wedding or watched one on TV or, or a movie uh, may have heard the couple recite their vows as a pledge to one another. Like, I promise to always be your friend. I've heard, I promise to always make you laugh. And I've even heard on TV, I promise to pick up my socks, those kinds of things. <laughs> and Sometimes there's a question asked of the couple by the officiant. Do you take this, this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Um, will you love and honor one another for the duration of your lives together? So this set of questions is called the exchange of consent. And it's important to understand that in order to have the Orthodox context. So in the, in the Roman um, Catholic tradition, the exchange of consent, do you take this or will you, all those things, is that's what actually makes the marriage. So by extension, the priest in the, in the Roman Catholic wedding or the Protestant officiant or the secular officiant uh, is really both, is really just acting as a witness to what is essentially the covenant or pledge made between the two people. So the Orthodox marriage is quite different from all of those ideas. There's, there's no vows in the Orthodox service of holy matrimony. There's no exchange of consent. The bride and groom are not asked whether they accept the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've, they've come as equals and no one gives away the bride. And in many Orthodox countries, the, the man and the woman enter the sanctuary together for their nuptials, escorted by their godparents, which I just learned that recently. I think, I, you know, I would have loved to do that. It didn't occur to me. <laughs> so there's no covenant. It's a mystical union. And those two words are really important. Uh, mystical union. The two mystically become one. How does that happen? We don't know. It's a mystery. But as yeah. one unit, they become mystically united to Christ. It's interesting that term mystery is understood differently 
in the East than in the West, because in the West, or um, I know I'm generalizing, but in, in our society, in America, a mystery is a riddle to be solved. Whereas in Orthodoxy, we enter into a mystery. It's not something that's explained. You know, you enter into liturgy, the Eucharist, the confession and marriage, and it's not something that's something that's simply intellectual, but something you enter into and experience. And that, that's such a beautiful way of understanding mystery. It's so important. And Father, that's why I stumbled on the idea of sacrament, because we the reason we call it holy mystery, yeah. sacrament yeah. comes from the Latin, which is a sacramentum, and it was a it was an oath to the death that a soldier would make to mm. the emperor. And it's very legalistic. And there's the sense of that sacrament where there's a promise. But the holy mystery, um, Jesus talks a lot about the mysteria. It's basically the the grace of God being fully present and fully revealed, not a secret at all, as you mentioned. Um, and and we receive God's grace and and participate in the light of of God's presence. So very very different understanding. So thank you for mentioning that as well. Yeah, and, and mystery also implies we don't know the specifics, right? How does God's grace work through us? How does God's grace guide us and so forth? But sometimes. Again, in Western culture, we, we become so intellectualized that we want to know such specifics, but mm -hmm. we have to be open to the, the mystery of God as well, right? Absolutely. So does the Orthodox Church view marriage primarily through the purpose of procreation? Okay, um, no. Um, so I guess this is another question that seems to kind of bring up uh, a Western view. Historically, Roman Catholicism has said for all of these years that the purpose, the only purpose of marriage was procreative union, in other words, to have children. Recently, the, the Roman Catholic Code of Canon Law was revised, I guess recently, 19, in the middle of 19, 1980s. Mm. And, the, and the idea of an interpersonal union was added to that idea. So that's also part of marriage, but the main purpose is still procreation. And, and that also has to do with the Roman Catholic um, views against birth control for that reason. But, um, and I've done a little bit of research on this. Paul Evdokimov has got an excellent book that I recommend to our audience, The Sacrament of Love, The Nuptial Mystery in the Light of the Orthodox Tradition. And in there, he summarizes that of all the texts of the Orthodox Church throughout the centuries, they're unanimous in placing the aim of, of nuptial life, of married life, in the spouses themselves. And Father John Meyendorf um, of Blessed Memory also points out that the New Testament is clear that, that marriage points, marriage is a justification in itself. Right. Uh, there is not a single New Testament text that points to procreation of having children as the justification for marriage. And even even St. John Chrysostom, if I might add, you know, he was very, very practical. And he wrote, he said, well, not every couple has children. Mary, Mary, many married couples are childless. And so he says that that cannot be the primary purpose of marriage. And it's what he true. says is that chastity is the primary purpose of marriage. In other words, the couple together. The family is complete in itself as a result of this. And if I can recall, one of the petitions or prayers in the marriage service says that may they be blessed with children as it may be best for them. Yes. So it, it doesn't make it a, a, you know, an insistence, but if this is what's best for the couple, may they be blessed, but it's still complete if you choose not to have children. So I think that's, that's an important part, even of the, the marriage service itself. Mm -hmm. So something else in your writings that, uh, that caught my attention. Do you note that in the writings of St. Clement of uh, St. Clement of Alexandria, he refers to marriage as a quote little kingdom, and St. John Chrysostom refers to marriage as quote ecclesial. So, how are the using these terms? Uh, how do we use these terms, and how do we apply it in our marriage? Because these are church terms that we may not be familiar with, but they're important enough that these saints refer to them. They're they're actually really important and they're beautiful, just gives a whole different perspective on marriage. You know, we Orthodox look back a lot at what the apostles uh, wrote and what the church fathers had to say about certain things, I think for good reason. If we're setting off on a journey, for example, it helps to hear from others 
you know, um, who've made the same journey. It's like having a map, uh, knowing which places to visit and which places to avoid. So yes, already in the late first century, early second century, St. Clement of Alexandria says that marriage constitutes a little kingdom, Mikra Vasilia. And this is why since at least the early fourth century, uh, but perhaps earlier, the bride and groom were actually crowned as king and queen of their new household. And as we know that, the Stephana, with ribbon connected wreaths, and in some Orthodox cultures, actual crowns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, this idea of the little kingdom is based on the idea that the husband and wife administer their household worthily and sacrificially as co-rulers. So you've got a lot of important things there, not just that, that it's a mini kingdom, but the two are equal um, as, as co-rulers. And this, the, the idea of uh, the crowns also reminds us of the, um, it's the second hymn of the dance of Isaiah as the couple is going around the, the marriage table three times. The second one is the hymn of the holy martyrs. And it says that they have fought the good fight and have received their glorious crowns. So there is an idea of marriage as martyrdom as well, that they, that they sacrifice themselves for the other. Um, no longer it's just about themselves. So this is kind of another, another way that marriage is a school. We have to learn to do that. We are not, you know, immediately as we get married, instantly um, no longer self-centered. We have yeah. to learn how to do this. <clears throat> Actually, two of the three hymns, as they go on the table, both refer to martyrdom. And, you know, people wonder, this is supposed to be a joyous occasion. Why are we talking about martyrdom? But the martyrs went to their death joyfully and willingly and willing to sacrifice, and no one was going to deny their faith. So what a great imagery that the church lifts up for us uh, in terms of the willing and joyful sacrifice uh, that's made in those hymns. I agree. Yeah. So let's talk about contemporary issues in terms of talking about Orthodox marriage today. Everything is very fast moving in terms of uh, social issues and so forth. So we live in an age of gender fluidity. So how does our faith view the role of husband and wife in a marriage? So, so we're going to the hard questions now, right? <laughs> yep, yep. The softball questions are over. <laughs> We do live in an age of gender fluidity. There's been a lot of ages of different things uh, that we can look back and look back and see. Um, and the the Bible is not a science book. We know that. Um, and yet there seems to be complete agreement in Holy Scripture with science on the point that God created only two biological genders. Now, I know that today in this age of gender fluidity, I know a lot of people are, are talking about one thing, biological sex, and the other thing, um, gender, uh, the two are defined differently today, but that's not the case in the Bible or in the Orthodox Church. So whenever the Bible refers to the mystical union of marriage, it is the physical and spiritual union of one person each of the two biological sexes, male and female. So I don't wanna to get too far into the theological weeds here, but there is an idea of the importance of otherness in Christian marriage, just as there is an important otherness in so many aspects of communion in the Orthodox Church. Uh, the Holy Trinity is a communion of otherness. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, and yet they are continue to be other. Uh, the Holy Eucharist, or I should say, even say the incarnation of Christ, he's otherness in himself, human and divine. The Holy Eucharist is a communion of that same otherness. And so the communion of Orthodox marriage, Orthodox Christian marriage is likewise a communion of otherness, one Christian male and one Christian female. And that's it. Yeah, that's, that's, our, that's our teaching and practice. So let's move from the social issues back to another kind of a theological question. And um, I just also want to go down a rabbit hole a little bit for our listeners. Tonight's webinar is really, I don't want to say didactic, but these are important teachings that Dr. Eve is offering to us because we are receiving so many 
different messages in our society. And it's important to either remind ourselves of what the teachings of the church are, or maybe learn them for the first time. So if it has that feeling that we're in a classroom, that's a good thing because we're here to, to learn and grow and uh, maybe have a different perspective of, of our own marriages. But going back to a, the, a theological question, Dr. Reeve, again, in one of your writings, you link the image of the Trinity to marriage. Can, can you elaborate a little on this idea? Yeah, I, I just brought that up. Um, thank you for, for furthering that. So yeah. th it's actually something that St. John Chrysostom wrote um, in, the, er, in the late, well, I think he wrote in the early fifth century. And he said, when husband and wife are united in marriage, they no longer seem like something earthly, but rather like the image of God himself. And that's really profound when we think about it. And I think there's that idea of otherness there as well. If, if we think about how we receive the image of God, uh, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that we were created in the image of God according to the likeness of God. Let us make man in our image. And right there, the Orthodox fathers hear the, hear the, the, the hour that we are created in the image of the Trinity. And this Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet their, um, their diversity is, is a communion. They are never separate, even though they retain their unique uh, personality. And so that's really, I know it's very esoteric. <laughs> it's okay. But, that, but this idea of unity and diversity is very, very orthodox, very Trinitarian. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are still one, are the same God. And their, their, their bond with one another is so intimate that this is how we can speak of God as one person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet still three. And this is the idea why so many of our church fathers and many contemporary Orthodox teachers talk about the same unity in diversity of Christian marriage. The two people are essentially different. They're different in many ways, including at the biological level, male and female. And that difference is essential. But the beautiful thing is that their communion or un union in holy matrimony makes them one, one family, one kingdom, one uh, little, little kingdom, one ecclesial unit, um, unity and diversity or we might say communion with one another, just like the communion in the Holy Trinity, or I should say as, as an icon of the communion of the Holy Trinity. Good. Let's underscore that because it's it really is an important, not just theological, but, but practical dimension. So the Holy Trinity is a unity because there are three persons, yet one God, but yet there's the diversity because each maintains their personhood, each maintains their uniqueness. And so... What you're saying is that within a marriage, there's a union, there's a mystical holy union, but that they still maintain their own personhood. So we have both unity and diversity. Would that be would that be yeah, accurate? Absolutely. Very well said, Father. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So let's get into some of the practical things. I know you and Steve have been married a very long time, and that's a great model for us. Model for us that uh, that it, this is possible, you know, to live a long and married life in this world with all of the challenges that exist, but as you see it, either from your um, own marriage or through your theological lens as a professor, what are some of the challenges we face in living out our Orthodox Christian marriage? Another another tough question. <laughs> Not that tough. Um, as you know, Father, my background is in academic theology, uh, and it's a far easier task for me to discuss marriage as an icon of Christ and the church or the Christian home is a place where spiritual growth should take place in all its members than to actually live it out day to day. But as you say, Steve and I've been married a long time. Um, and I won't say how long, but we met when I was 15. <laughs> and uh, it seems to me that all of the challenges of marriage are the challenges of life, of all relationships, especially the close ones, mothers and daughters. We have three daughters, fathers and sons, whether we are part of a family, um, a biological family, or a monastery, or serve in a parish, or work closely with others, there can be struggles in even the strongest of relationships. So our theology of communion, how, as beautiful it as it is, it's something to, be, to live up to. But it goes away very quickly when one is not so happy 
at the present moment with a spouse, or when young children are continuously fighting with one another, or we're dealing with financial problems or serious illness. But communion as a couple for the Orthodox has never been theoretical pie in the sky. It's God's original intention for the human family, for male and female to be united together to one another and that unit united to Christ. So that intention has not changed. But St. Paul, St. John Chrysostom, they've, they've given us on one hand the ideal, but both of them are very, very practical. If we looked at, at some of the sermons of St. John Chrysostom, he was dealing with many of the same problems of our society. Uh, he talks about prostitution, the problems of prostitution, spousal abuse, sexual immorality, abortion, gambling, swearing, and, and even empty churches. So our, our task as a Christian married couple is to try to follow the ideal, even though it may be challenging, and however much we fall down in trying. So, mm -hmm. so all of that background to answer your specific question. I, I think we just follow the New Testament with all of the, all of the um, challenges. St. Paul, for I'm sorry, St. James, for example, says um, something that we should all do. Quick to listen, slow to anger, slow to speak. Right there, perfect way to live out a marriage. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Uh, the first thing is marriage requires um, humility, patience, love, all above all the grace of God. So we need to learn how to get along. And that really is where marriage becomes the school in which the husband and wife learn together how to practice being good Christians. That's you I know, that's I'm always step. encouraged, Dr. Eve, in reviewing and celebrating the marriage service when we read the long list of the married people in the scripture uh, of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca and Joachim and Anna. And I, I think it just gives us a kind of a roll call of these people were married, they model for us married, they all lived during difficult times and had their challenges, and yet we still lift them up as saints. So I, I just am so encouraged reading those lists of names uh, in, in, the, in the marriage service so that uh, it gives the couple encouragement when they when they exit the church that we, we can do this too. It's been done throughout history and you know we can we can do this as well too. Absolutely. And one of the things that those all those couples did and one of our ideals is to grow in faith together. And the married couple is supposed to grow in faith together. That means different things for different couples. But I think the thread must be similar, that the couple should worship together, pray together, be committed to marital faithfulness in all things. And even, you know, to committed to an Orthodox Christian lifestyle, which, you know, try to follow the liturgical cycle of feasts and fasts and feasts, for example. I mean, everybody's going to do it in a different way, but they should grow in grace and knowledge, as St. Peter says, to, in Christ together. Can we also lift up the scriptural example of Christ as the bridegroom and that in a way we're kind of married ourselves to Christ, that level of intimacy? Um, I, I know it's not exactly marriage as such, but that's the degree of intimacy that we have with, with God is is to the degree of actually using that kind of language of bridegroom and so forth. Any thoughts on just how you read scripture or, or just in terms of the imagery of Christ being our bridegroom? That's such a big part of the early days of Holy Week, of course, uh, from the parable, but just in general, just your thoughts about that. Well, really, that's that's exactly where St. Paul goes with the, um, the epistle reading that is read during the marriage ceremony. Um, and this is why he calls marriage a great mystery. He says, if, well, if we think about what to your point, if we think about Jesus Christ as the bridegroom, what did he do? He loved his bride, the church, so much that he died even for those who hated him. A ultimate sacrifice. Um, and not even everybody for whom he's sacrificing is responding to that love. Mm -hmm. And that's that's exactly why St. Paul talks about the idea that um, that well, he, he places the, the husband 
in the role or in, as an icon of Christ and says that he should love and sacrifice and care for his wife in the same way that Christ has been the bridegroom of the church. It's really quite beautiful and very profound. And I think that, you know, in the excitement of the, of the wedding day, maybe the bride and groom don't always pay attention to this very, very important epistle. That's a great point, Dr. Tibbs. It's, there's a complementarity that I think the epistle is lifting up. And, and since we're talking about marriage, we can also address this, that sometimes in the early part of the epistle, the first part, when it talks about the wife submitting to the husband, and of course we live in this age of equality, understandably so, but we, we neglect that second part, that the husband loved the wife as much as Christ loved the church and gave his life. And when you sense that sense of, uh, when you read that sense of uh, total sacrifice, it really puts in perspective the demands on both the husband and the wife. So we, we have to read both parts, right? Absolutely. And St. John Chrysostom, I, I love his writing because, again, he's so practical. And he was uh, actually commenting on um, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians here. And he says marriage should be an equal partnership. And he challenged both the husband and the wife to be self-emptying like Christ for the sake of the other. So this is very much the idea of martyrdom. The martyr, not, you know, not actual martyrdom, but the martyrdom of self and the self-will. And that's what makes a beautiful marriage. And to your point about equality, there's such an egalitarian aspect to the service. This is an ancient service, right? Long before women's suffrage and equal rights. Mm -hmm. And everything is done with both the bride and groom together, right? They both are wearing rings. They both are wearing the crowns. They both take the sip of the wine. They both go around the table. So th there's that sense of equality, right? In, the, in that very ancient service, as, as you've highlighted. Very much so. Yes, thank you. So we're ready to close uh, shortly, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity. Any final thoughts? I know we covered a lot of ground. There are probably some things that we, we didn't have a chance to cover, but just any final thoughts for our viewers tonight? Um, no, marriage is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't really talk about children. Uh, we did talk about the fact that Orthodox Christian marriage focuses on the couple, but um, many couples are blessed with children. And if they are, that but they should actively raise them uh, in the Orthodox Christian faith. And I think, I think we're in a different world from St. Paul and St. John Chrysostom, but um, their words are still are still appropriate for all of us. There's no sense that that either of the of those or any of the writers of, of Orthodox Christian marriage think that the ideals are easy to attain, uh, that there's such a thing as perfect marriage. We are all challenged. We're all struggling. We are all learning to be more like Christ, Christ um, in our homes. Um, so um, it, this is exactly why St. John said that um, the, the marriage can um, can image. Um, it, sorry, the the uh, the marriage um, resembles the icon of the Trinity. So I was looking at at another quote that I had here uh, that Saint John said: "When husband and wife cling to each other in love, there is a remnant of paradise." In other words, beautiful. Um, whatever the problems were that caused Adam and Eve to be led out of paradise. Uh, Orthodox Christian marriage can heal that. And to your point about the challenges and struggle of marriage, we struggle and feel challenged in our own spiritual lives, right? Just in the way that we're trying to grow in our relationship with Christ. So in a parallel way, we are involved in those same similar types of challenges and struggles in our married life. And that's not something we should be discouraged about, but to 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 receive and and uh, seek the strength and grace of Christ in the same way that we do in our in our own spiritual lives. But instead, in a married life, we're just as concerned with our spouse's salvation as much as much as our own. So we want to express great thanks to our guest this evening, Dr. Badaskivi Tibbs. And again, for those family and friends that were not able to join us live tonight, uh, this webinar is being recorded, will be available and posted on our website, family.goarch.org, and also on our Facebook page. Thank you, Dr. Tip, so much for your presence and prayers this evening. Thank you, Father, so much. It's been a great honor.